So here we're going to cover uh, antibiotics, namely antibacterials, and it's good to watch things from the antibiotic perspective, so knowing which drugs treat which diseases, and it's good to watch things from the uh, pathogen perspective, so which diseases are treated by which drugs, uh, because this is really a two-way street. So here we're going to talk about infectious disease from the antibiotic perspective. So this is sort of a diagram of all of the antibacterials, and it looks like a lot, and it is, but this really isn't even the half of them. This is just the ones that, in my opinion, come up most commonly on the USMLE. The ones highlighted in green are antibacterials effective against Pseudomonas. The ones that are highlighted in violet are effective against MRSA. So we're going to start out with the penicillins, which are the traditional penicillins and the semi-synthetic penicillins. All right, so what are penicillins? Traditionally, they're used for gram-positive infections. That's really the only thing they're, uh, well, presently for the USMLE, they're useful against. They block cell wall formation, and originally they were effective against both staph and strep, but it took only about a year for staph to become resistant to uh, most of the penicillins. So even though you may have a staph infection, a penicillin is never the correct answer on the USMLE for, uh, for a staph infection. Penicillins, uh, the traditional penicillins at least, penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin, they're primarily used for strep infections only. An exception to this would be, for instance, syphilis. Syphilis, the drug of choice, is penicillin. Another instance where you use penicillin would be group B strep prophylaxis in pregnancy. If a woman has group B strep on her cervix or in her vagina, then indeed you're going to be putting her on penicillin prophylaxis to prevent that being transmitted to the baby because that can cause meningitis. Amoxicillin is used commonly in ear infections uh, in children. So it's also used in strep throat. Those are both caused by uh, strep infections. So the traditional penicillins, primarily we use them against strep infections. Now there is a class of penicillins that are known as semi-synthetic penicillins, and they, these can be used for staph. So what these have is a modification that makes them resistant to uh, beta-lactamase, which is the actual chemical that the bacteria makes that makes penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin ineffective. So oxicillin, nafcillin, dicloxicillin, and cloxicillin are all good for staph infections, but they're not good for MRSA. What does MRSA stand for? Methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Well, where's methicillin? What's methicillin? Methicillin was sort of like the first beta-lactamase-resistant uh, penicillin. It was the first semi-synthetic penicillin. We never use methicillin anymore because of its side effects. So when we say MRSA, that's just sort of an, an old-fashioned term. We could really just say oxicillin resistant staph aureus or nafcillin resistant staph aureus. So if it's MRSA, we can't even use the beta-lactamase, the semi-synthetic resistant penicillins. They're only useful, useful for uh, non-MRSA staph aureus. The adverse effects are rash and hypersensitivity. A good chunk of the population are allergic to penicillin. Uh, if that's the case, we can generally replace with a macrolide. Some other facts, ampicillin is used for Lyme disease in patients under 8. Normally we would use doxycycline. But in patients who are under the age of eight, we prefer to use line, uh, we prefer to use ampicillin, and then as I mentioned, IV penicillin for group B strep mothers. So the cephalosporins are similar to the penicillins in uh, structure. Uh, they're used traditionally for a wide range of infections, and there's multiple generations of cephalosporins, which just simply reflect the uh, the efficacy against uh, different. Uh, Bugs. So, for instance, cefazolin or cephalexin is not even remotely the same drug as cefepime, but they're both cephalosporins. 
So you have a first generation, second generation, third generation, and fourth generation groups. Now the rule of thumb is that first generation and second generation is more effective against gram positives, and as you get more towards the fourth generation, it's more effective against gram negatives. None of these, however, are effective against Listeria or MRSA. What they do have unique to them is in ceftazidime and cefepime, they are effective against Pseudomonas. And that's very, very important to remember. So ceftazidime and cefepime are two, the two cephalosporins effective against Pseudomonas. Cephalosporins are useful in that they have good penetration of the meninges and central nervous system, so they're widely used for meningitis and encephalitis. The adverse effects, they're generally well tolerated, however 10% of patients who are allergic to penicillin will be allergic to cephalosporins as well. As I mentioned, ceftazidime and cefepime are useful against pseudomonas, and first and second generation cephalosporins are used in pretty much the same manner that we use the semi-synthetic penicillins. So, for instance, whoops, if a patient has a staph infection, we can, and we know it's not MRSA, or we assume it's not MRSA, we can use cephalexin, or we can use cefotetin, uh, just like we could use oxacillin or cloxacillin. So important to know the differences between the first, second, third, and fourth generation of cephalosporins. Important to know there's good penetration of the meninges. Important to know that it, they're not effective against listeria um, but, uh, or MRSA, but ceftazidime and cefepime are good drugs for pseudomonas. Okay, how about the macrolides? So the macrolides are effective against a wide range of gram-positive bacteria. Hmm, what does that sound like? That sounds like penicillins. And indeed, they do everything a penicillin does, and a little bit more. Now why the macrolides are important is because these are the go-to drugs when a patient is allergic to penicillins. If a patient is allergic to penicillin, and let's say they get strep throat, or they get an ear infection, then rather than putting them on amoxicillin, you're going to put them on something like azithromycin. So macrolides, remember I said they do everything a penicillin does and more. What's that more that they do? They cover atypicals. So they cover Legionella, which is a common cause of, or a, not so much common cause, but a, a possible cause of pneumonia. They cover mycoplasma, which is the walking pneumonia. They cover uh, mycobacteria. They cover uh, chlamydia. And they cover Haemophilus influenza. Clarithromycin plays a couple unique roles. It's played in the treatment of MAC complex uh, in HIV and AIDS patients, Mycobacterium avium complex. And uh, so this is a disease, an opportunistic disease that uh, AIDS patients get when their CD4 counts drop enough. Azithromycin is used as a prophylaxis for that disease, so macrolides play an important role in both the prevention and the treatment of mycobacterium avium complex disease in HIV AIDS patients. Again, like I said, if you think the patient has atypical pneumonia, you're going to give them azithromycin. So what is atypical pneumonia? Atypical pneumonia is usually Patients, younger patients, they've got dys dyspnea, short of breath, non-productive cough. You go and you do a chest x-ray, and rather than seeing a low bar consolidation, you see uh, patchy infiltrates uh, in the entire lung field. So you see a pneumonia that looks a lot worse than it really is. These patients usually aren't as sick. In that case, you're going to give them azithromycin. Why? Because they have an atypical pneumonia. Again, like I said, this is the go-to drug in patients that are allergic to penicillin. And the adverse effects, these are generally well tolerated, but you should avoid using macrolides in uh, patients with statins because it can increase uh, muscle breakdown and, uh, and that's problematic. Okay, uh, azithromycin is the drug of choice for rocking pneumonia. I told you about that. And, uh, it's also given with ceftriaxone if the patient is diagnosed with either chlamydia or gonorrhea. So in the STD section, we talked about being diagnosed with chlamydia or gonorrhea. 
And uh, if, if you diagnose a patient with either chlamydia or gonorrhea, immediately you're going to give them azithromycin, PO, and ceftriaxone intramuscular injection. Now, it's actually the azithromycin that's effective against the chlamydia and the ceftriaxone that's effective against the gonorrhea. But the fact is, a lot of patients either uh, are carrying the other asymptomatically or there was a misdiagnosis, so we prefer to just give them both no matter what. Uh, if they're diagnosed with one or the other, we treat them for both. Okay, quinolones. So these are a little bit different. So these are effective against a wide range of bacteria, but with emphasis on group or on gram-negative bacteria. They still cover staph and strep, though. So because they cover gram-negative bacteria, they cover staph, they cover strep, these are good drugs to use for empiric therapy. It's part of an empiric regimen. And particularly, they're good against pneumonia. Why are they good against pneumonia? Well, let's remember what the causes of pneumonia are. They're streptococcus. They can be uh, aspiration pneumonia. Uh, and so there you go. There is your uh, strep and your, uh, and your gram-negative bacteria right there. So quinolones are good for pneumonia. Also, atypicals is another cause of pneumonia. I guess not as common, but uh, quinolones also cover atypicals. So you're talking Legionella. If you've got mycoplasma pneumonia, if you've got aspiration, if you've got uh, regular old uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, all of these will be covered by quinolones. So quinolones are good empiric therapy in general. So that's where you're going to see this. They're also used in urinary tract infections and prostatitis. Ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin are often used in patients with intractable infectious diarrhea. Now remember, infectious diarrhea, we generally don't treat it with uh, antibiotics. We usually treat uh, with supportive therapy, fluids, and so forth, and, uh, and observation. However, if the patient is febrile, if the patient is, uh, has other illness, uh, then we're going to go ahead and treat them with an antibiotic. And because quinolones are so effective against the group ne or the gram-negative bacteria, against the enterococci, ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin, uh, particularly ciprofloxacin, are what we're going to use against the infectious diarrhea because they, they cover most of the causes. The adverse effects, uh, generally, again, quinolones are pretty well tolerated. They have a low risk of tendon rupture. Uh, I don't know why that is, but just remember that quinolones are associated with tendon rupture. And then, like any antibiotic, virtually all of them are associated with C. diff diarrhea, but quinolones a little bit more so. And that's just because they're active in the bowels. Avoid quinolones in pregnancy. That's going to be something to remember. Quinolones uh, are effective against DNA gyrase, so in anything that's developing, affecting a, uh, something that's important for uh, DNA formation in general, uh, you're going to want to stay away from using that in pregnancy because you've got a baby developing, so uh, we stay away from quinolones in pregnancy. Okay, aminoglycosides. So aminoglycosides are effective against a wide range of bacteria, but mostly we use them against gram-negative bacteria. But the good thing is aminoglycosides are uh, very effective in general against Pseudomonas. One thing to note here is that as trianam, and I put it in parentheses on here and in stars, as trianam is only effective against gram-negative bacteria. Now why, is, why would you use as trianam? Let's say you're using something that's primarily effective against gram-positive bacteria. So let's say you're using a macrolide. As trianam would be a good addition to that if you want to make it an empiric coverage, because as trianam covers pretty much all of the gram-negative drugs, or bugs, rather. So commonly, we use aminoglycosides in combination with a penicillin. So kind of like I mentioned, we have good gram-negative coverage here, but we want to use, uh, if we want to use this in, uh, in a, an empiric coverage, then we're going to combine it with something that has better coverage against gram-positive bacteria. So we'll use this in combination a lot with a penicillin or with a macrolide, uh, 
and we use this for severe internal infections. And this, this is a great uh, regimen. So a lot of times you'll see uh, ampicillin and gentamicin, ampicillin being a traditional penicillin and gentamicin being an aminoglycoside. Gentamicin knocks out most of the gram-negative ne gram bugs and ampicillin knocks out most of the gram-positive drugs. Uh, Amino, uh, aminoglycosides are effective against listeria in general. So listeria manifests generally as listeria meningitis, and you'll see this kind of meningitis in both the very, very young and in the very, very old. So gentamicin is something that you'll want to add to any meningitis, empiric meningitis therapy in a patient that's over the age of 60 or under the age of 2. The adverse effects for aminoglycosides is ototoxicity and renal failure. And remember that aminoglycosides have efficacy against listeria and pseudomonas, and then remember the AMP-GENT combination. USMLE will probably throw a, a question at you, and AMP-GENT will be the answer, because AMP-GENT has a really, really great uh, range of coverage. Again, aminoglycosides, these are also not to be used in pregnancy because of the renal failure and ototoxicity in the developing fetus. Okay. Carbapenems. So carbapenems are not commonly used, and the reason they're not commonly used is because they're so darn effective. We don't want to get bugs that develop resistance to these because these are sort of our, our silver, silver bullet, so to speak. So the one thing, they, they pretty much cover everything, but the one thing they don't cover is the atypicals. So you should remember that. But these are very, very, very effective drugs. They are effective against pseudomonas with the affection of ertapenum. So we have imipenum, meropenum, and ertapenum. Uh, they cover, they, imipenum and meropenum both cover pseudomonas. Ertapenum does not. Like I said, rarely it's a first choice time you're going to commonly see this, of course, if you have pseudomonas, you may see imipenum or meropenum as an option. Those are both good choices. Uh, but a place they're commonly used is in patients with febrile neutropenia. So what is febrile neutropenia? That's kind of like a, feb a fever of unknown origin. The patient has neutropenia. So really, they could have a lot of things. And you don't know. You're doing cultures and everything. But you want to get this patient covered for anything. So you're going to put this patient on something that has a huge range of effect efficacy. So you'll put them on imipenum uh, or meropenum, as well as something that covers the atypicals. Imipenum is never administered alone. It's administered with a uh, beta-lactam inhibitor known as silostatin, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Ertapenum is highly effective against anaerobes, but it is not effective against pseudomonas. So the adverse effects here are diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, really nonspecific side effects. And like I said, these drugs are more commonly used as a second choice, and when the patients uh, get them, they're usually the more ill patients. How about the tetracyclines? So we tend to not use tetracycline very often. We usually use doxycycline. They, are, uh, they have activity against gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and they also have antiprotozoal properties. So they cover atypicals, uh, but generally we don't use them for, well, I guess we use them for chlamydia. So yes, we do use doxycycline for atypicals. Uh, doxycycline is used more commonly, as I mentioned, than tetracycline. Doxycycline is, is used against a wide range of different diseases, and they really have no relation to each other. So you should just memorize it. They're used against various STDs like chlamydia, they're used against pelvic inflammatory disease, which can be caused from chlamydia. They're used against rickettsial seal diseases like Lyme's disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. They're used against Q fever, which remember is coxiella and it's caused from exposure to uh, cattle or goat placenta. And they're also used for the prevention of malaria and the prevention of anthrax exposure. This is totally random and so you should just go ahead and memorize this. Tigacycline is sort of a cousin of the tetracyclines. It's called a glycyl cycline. 
And Taiga cycling was developed in response to the rapidly emerging amounts of, uh, of, of resistant Staph aureus. So Taiga cycling is another one of those drugs that's sort of a silver bullet, but we try to avoid using it as much as we can because we don't want resistance to develop. When we do use it is in severe skin or soft tissue infection that's likely or probably caused by MRSA and we use it in certain intra-abdominal infections. The time you're probably going to use ticocycline on the USMLE is when the patient has a MRSA skin infection and they've already been on anti different antibiotics uh, that cover MRSA already. The adverse effects here are worsening of liver function and phototoxicity, and none of these drugs should be used in children under the age of eight. With the notable exception of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, we do use doxycycline. So Lyme's disease, we use amoxicillin for kids under eight, doxycycline for everybody else. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, we use doxycycline for everybody. And again, this is something to avoid in pregnancy. All right, so vancomycin is a drug that's really good against gram-positive and anaerobes. Particularly, vancomycin is good against MRSA, and it's good against C. diff diarrhea. So what's a patient with C. diff diarrhea? They're the patient that's been in the hospital for four or five days. They've been on antibiotics for, let's say, their pneumonia, and then suddenly, while they've been in the hospital, they develop diarrhea. A lot of nurses say they can smell C. diff diarrhea, that it has a certain smell to it. I think that's kind of gross, but you may hear that from a nurse. Not on the USMLE though. But uh, anyhow, if you have a patient that develops diarrhea while they've been in the hospital, you make sure you get that C. diff assay. If the C. diff assay comes back positive, vancomycin or metronidazole are going to be one of your drugs of choice. Any antibiotic can cause C. diff diarrhea. Vancomycin, in general, is a good choice as an empiric antibiotic because it covers gram-positive uh, bugs, it covers anaerobic bugs, that should say bugs there, not drugs, uh, and it also covers MRSA, but it doesn't cover gram-negatives as well, so we're going to NA atypicals, so we're going to want to add something that covers gram-negatives and atypicals, and what does that? Tetracyclines do that. So we could use doxycycline in addition to vancomycin, and that would be a good empiric coverage. Adverse effects of vancomycin is diarrhea, not C. diff diarrhea, of course, and nausea and vomiting. And like I said, this is a drug of choice when treating C. diff diarrhea. So penicillin beta lactamase combos. The primary reason I give this uh, group of drugs is for treating pseudomonas. There's only one drug, though, on here that's effective against pseudomonas, and that's Piperacillin Tazobactam. Write this in your notes, because this drug is probably the most common one to come up on the USMLE for treatment against pseudomonas. So Piperacillin Tazobactam. None of these treat MRSA, but they all treat they all have a good wide range of coverage against gram-positive and gram-negative bugs. So what's here in the orange is just the beta-lactamase. Beta-lactamases do not have any antibiotic properties. What they do is they augment the drug that they're added to. So for instance, piperacillin, amoxicillin, ampicillin, and I suppose imipenem, they all do things on their own, yes. But if you add this beta-lactamase, they do more. So imipenem is never given alone. Remember, that's that uh, carbapenem that we don't ever give alone. We give it with psilostatin. And when we give it with psilostatin, it has a nice wide range of coverage. Amoxicillin and ampicillin, we can give them alone, or we can give them respectively with clavulonate or sulbactam. And then piperacillin, tazobactam, is, uh, is the effective drug against pseudomonas. So I don't see these commonly used, uh, nor do I see them commonly come up on the USMLE with the notable exception of Piperacillin Tazobactam and Imipenem Psilostatin. Uh, the thing is, is that beta-lactamase, I mean the beta-lactamase itself, so let's say clavulonate for instance, has a serious adverse effect of diarrhea. I mean it's not going to kill you, but it's diarrhea anyway. And some, I've seen some 
clinicians give amoxicillin clavulanate to patients with an ear infection or sore throat. That drug is known as amox or as augmentin. And the reason they do this is because they get more money out of it. You don't need to give amoxicillin clavulanate to a patient with ear infection. You can just give them amoxicillin. I mean, unless you want to give your patient with an ear infection severe diarrhea as a side effect. So I don't see as much use for amoxicillin clavulanate or ampicillin sulbactam, but definitely, definitely, definitely remember picrocillin tazobactam and remember imipenem psilostatin because those do have prominent uses. Uh, any of these have good empiric coverage if you're not talking about MRSA, but in general, when you want to use empiric coverage, you're going to want to choose two drugs, not one of these penicillin beta lactamase combos. So for instance, ampicillin and gentamicin. Ampicillin covering your gram-positive bacteria, gentamicin covering your gram-negative bacteria. Okay, anti-anaerobes. So there are a lot of drugs that are particularly good against anaerobes. These are possibly uh, the best. So Clindamycin in general is used for anaerobes above the diaphragm. We use clindamycin with benzoyl peroxide in a component called DUAC. You may see this come up on the USMLE. Clindamycin used for acne. Uh, metronidazole, however, is used for anaerobes below the diaphragm. So for instance, C. diff diarrhea. So Clindamycin is a go-to in toxic shock syndrome, and it's useful to cover anaerobes and empiric coverage. Metronidazole is used for bacterial vaginosis. Remember, like I said, below the diaphragm. Uh, bacterial vaginosis, trichomoniasis. You should have seen the uh, lecture on, uh, on vaginal infections. It's also used for diarrheal amoebiasis, so that would be diarrhea caused from, from entamoeba histolytica, and for giardiasis, so that would be diarrhea caused from giardia lamblia. Diarrheal amoebiasis, entamoeba histolytica, would be a bloody diarrhea. Giardiasis would be a fatty, watery diarrhea, usually proximal to drinking stream water or camping. So the adverse effects, clindamycin itself is the number one most commonly associated antibiotic associated with C. diff diarrhea. Metronidazole, on the other hand, is one of the drugs that treat it. Okay, and here's some of the others that I put just because they do belong to classes, but they were some of the pretty much the only ones that I wanted to talk about. So trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is commonly used for UTIs. And unless suggested otherwise, it is your drug of choice for a UTI. When you wouldn't use trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is a pregnant patient because this blocks folate. Uh, so trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, though, and generally used in UTIs. If the patient's allergic, again, you would not want to use trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. You'd use phosphomycin or nitrofurantoin. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, it's commonly referred to as Bactrim. It's also used in uh, PCP prophylaxis, so another one of those opportunistic infections that happen in HIV AIDS patients. Pneumocystis carini uh, pneumonia or pneumocystis girovecchi pneumonia. Uh, you use tri trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. If the patient is allergic to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for PCP prophylaxis, we use Dapsone. Uh, rifampicin or rifampin is known for its use against TB. Uh, I, sulfadiazine, I don't know why I put that in here. I didn't really have anything useful to say about that. So rifampin is used against TB. That's how it's most commonly known as. It's also used as prophylaxis for patients that are close contact with uh, people with meningococcal meningitis. So let's say your dorm mate or your sister that you live in a house with gets meningococcal meningitis was diagnosed with that, then you'll probably want to get rifampicin. Any, any close household contacts. Uh, rifampin is also used for uh, H influenza infections, and it has a high side effect profile, and that would be hepatotoxicity. Linazolid is a anti-MRSA drug, and it's used for highly resistant skin infections, and it is also effective, as I mentioned, against MRSA. Okay, and then here's one more. 
So this kind of fell under uh, a cloud of the macrolides, but it's not really a macrolide because it's not really used as a macrolide. So pristinomycin was developed as a macrolide, but as they continued doing research on this drug, they found that two of the byproducts of this drug uh, can be used together and it can actually be effective against MRSA. So quinupristin and delphapristin are, uh, are they're, they're one drug, they're not two drugs. Quinupristin and delphapristin uh, are synthesized out of pristinomycin, which is a macrolide, and it is effective against MRSA. So uh, quinupristin, delphapristin is an anti-MRSA drug. So let's review. So how do we treat pseudomonas? We've got a lot of drugs. So we've got piperacillin tazobactam, which is the common, uh, probably the most common drug for anti-pseudomonas. Uh, that's the combo uh, penicillin beta lactamase uh, drug. Ceftazidime is a third generation cephalosporin. Uh, Cefepime is a fourth generation cephalosporin. Imipenum and mirapenum are, uh, are also drugs that are effective. Uh, those are carbapenems. Gentamycin, amikacin, tobramycin, uh, those are uh, your aminoglycosides, and astreonam is also an aminoglycoside that's only effective against gram-negatives. But all of these drugs, all nine of these, are good to treat pseudomonas. How about treating MRSA? Vancomycin, linazolid, the recently mentioned quinupristin, dalfapristin, and tigacycline. Okay, remember doxycycline? You should remember, just memorize the things that you use doxycycline for as the drug of choice because it's a lot of random things. So lymphogranuloma venereum, that's an STD. That's a condition where you get a painless ulcer and you get bilateral uh, lymphadenopathy, inguinal lymphadenopathy. It's not common in the U.S. Granuloma inguinale, you get this beefy red ulceration. It's also relatively painless. And then you get these vegetative lesions surrounding it. Again, this is not common in the U.S., but you use doxycycline for both of these. Uh, and to learn more about these, just go to the STD section. Lyme's disease, you use doxycycline only if the patient's older than 8. If they're young, younger than 8, then you're going to use amoxicillin. This is a tick-borne disease. You come up with joint pain, fever, and erythema migrans, which is a rash that looks like target, like a target sign and it develops on the trunk. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, on the other hand, while it is tick-borne, it does come up with fever. Uh, this is a maculopapular rash, and it develops on the extremities, on the hands, and on the feet, and it spreads inward. So it doesn't develop on the trunk, it develops on the hands and feet. Again, this is a tick-borne disease that we treat with doxycycline, but unlike Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever Everybody from cradle to grave, well, presumably not grave, gets doxycycline. Q fever, those are the people who work with sheep, goat, and cattle placentas. They have flu-like symptoms, myalgia, diarrhea, hepatitis. Q fever, treat with doxycycline. This is not a completely inclusive list, list of, uh, of diseases that are treated by doxycycline, but these are some of the common ones that come up. So if there's any other uh, diseases that are treated with doxycycline only as the particular drug of choice, I definitely invite you to write them down in the comments. That would be appreciated. Okay, and here is everything we went over. So we actually covered all of these. Good job.